In this video, we are going to talk about how copra gets inside of a via. You know, when you have a multi-layer PCB and when you drill vias, then you need to somehow put copper inside of these vias to connect the layers together. And uh, this process of putting copper inside of via, it is called plating. And I always knew there are like two main steps or two main processes in this plating. I just uh, never really understood um, how exactly it is done. And uh, in this video, we are going to have a closer look what exactly is happening when this plating is done. And uh, because I'm not expert for this topic, I uh, found someone else. And in this video, we are going to talk to Kaylee. And what she did, she manufactured a PCB by herself and she also plated her own PCB. Okay, so she exactly knows how to put copper inside of vias. And in this video, she's going to uh, explain how it is done. By the end of this video, we are going to talk also about a few things which if you are ordering a PCB, you may find them useful. We are going to talk about surface finish. And finally, I know what ENIC means and how it is done. And we are going to talk also about gold fingers and castellated holes. You know, castellated holes are the parts on the edge of PCB and they are usually used to solder the PCB. And the gold fingers, yeah, these are used usually again on the edge of the board, but this board is plugged in somewhere. Uh, in this video, we are going to use a couple of pages from this advanced circuit presentation. If you like, you can download full presentation from this link. And also we will mention this um, video from EuroCircuit. If you like, you can watch it. It explains how a PCB is manufactured. If uh, you would like to know more about Kaylee, you can just go on her website. Okay, that's enough for introduction. I really hope you will find this video interesting and uh, I really hope you will enjoy the content. We are going to start with drilling. So imagine that uh, we have a board and we just drilled the holes. And uh, in this first clip, from my call with Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee is going to explain what we need to do next, what we need to do next after drilling. So here is the very first clip. On a two layer board, we go right to copper plating. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that in a moment. But before we can plate, there's a problem that we have to take care of. On multi-layer boards, the, the drill is coming through at a very, very high speed, even up to 120,000 RPM. And as it's going in and then it's pulled back out, it's going to melt some of that epoxy on the inside of the, on the, inside of the hole, and it will smear it all over the inside of the hole, including on the surfaces of the metal of the annular rings. And in order to electrically connect all of the annular rings within the barrel of a via, you need to make sure that you have nice exposed edges of the, the inner ring of the annular ring. So the first thing that we have to do before we can plate on a multi-layer board is remove the drill smear. And uh, they do that with a chemical process that generally oxidizes the epoxy. Uh, often it's potassium permanganate in a, a hot uh, heated solution of potassium permanganate, which will oxidize the epoxy uh, in, a, in a sense that uh, chemically decomposes it on that surface. And uh, in order to remove this very, very thin layer of epoxy that otherwise will conformally coat 
the metal and prevent an electrical contact in the next step. Okay, let's stop for a moment because this was something new, at least for me. I, I never really thought that after we drill holes, we need to clean them. And uh, I never really thought that when we are drilling holes, the epoxy, it can melt. And uh, this epoxy can cover edges of planes. And then basically this epoxy can prevent good contact between plane and the wall of a via. So yeah, this was something interesting. Now, probably everyone knows we can use electricity to transfer copper to a surface. And this process is called electroplating. And we will speak about this process a little bit later in this video. The problem with electroplating is that you only can apply it on a surface which is conductive, which can uh, conduct electricity. And our vias at this moment, they are not conductive. There is epoxy. So before we actually uh, use electroplating, we need to find a way how to put inside of our vias something conductive but without using electricity. And that process is called, you can guess, electroless plating. Yes! And that's what Kaylee is going to talk about next. So here is the next part of my call with Kaylee. With electroless plating, the reaction proceeds with copper depositing on the PCB with no externally applied current. And that's important because if you think about it, the one issue with plating the inside of a hole is there's nothing conductive between those inner layers and the outer layers. It's fiberglass. Fiberglass is not conductive. It's actually a phenomenal insulator. It's why we build our PCBs with it. You cannot electroplate onto surfaces that are not conductive. So if you put the board into the electroplating now, you would build up copper on the outer surfaces, but you would have no copper inside the via barrels. So the first thing we have to do is render the insides of the holes, all your through holes, all of your vias. If you have edge plating, then the edges of the board uh, as well. If you have castellated holes, which are really just fancy edge plating in a scooped shape, same thing. Uh, we need to render all of those surfaces just somewhat conductive so that we can then electroplate. But that still leaves us with a problem. How do you get copper to stick to fiberglass? And the answer to that is it's a, a relatively long involved chemical process. And one uh, that I uh, actually did as an experiment myself, uh, I made some of my own printed circuit boards uh, in my undergrad. So I spent a lot of time reading patents and papers to really deeply understand this. So I, here's my, here's my plating line. So this is my fume hood, approximately 100 milliliter per bath scale version of a full scale copper plating line. You put the board in on one side, you swish it around, you rinse it. You do that through each bath, it comes out of the last one and there's copper over all fiberglass surfaces. So I'm gonna walk through those steps uh, in, uh, in a little bit more detail here. So remember I said at the beginning, we have this, this fiberglass, uh, which is composed of the glass component and the epoxy. The epoxy is an organic molecule, it's a polymer, and there are all these chemical functionalities that in the presence of certain chemicals can be rendered uh, charged. So in the first bath, we have what's called a micro etch. And this is usually an oxidizer, mild oxidizer, uh, like a, some kind of a persulfate, like sodium persulfate, which can actually be used uh, to etch copper. But this is a much more dilute solution, so it won't etch the copper. And it will uh, chemically modify the surface uh, inside the holes in order to generate a very mild 
uh, charge on the inside of the hole, which will then uh, electrostatically attract pin ions in the next important step. There are, uh, so there's tin ions uh, in solution. It's again, a, a relatively dilute solution. These are tin two plus, usually in the form of tin chloride, SNCl2. The tin is electrostatically attracted to these dangling bonds on the epoxy and it will just kind of stay there. So on the inside of the holes, you'll now have tin ions just kind of conformally coating the surfaces. Uh, not, uh, not kind of shoulder to shoulder, they're kind of spread out, um, but that's okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. You can't see anything at this step. The, the pin solution is clear and the tin ions that get attracted into the holes produce no color change. So at this point, the board looks exactly like it looked uh, at the beginning. Maybe the copper looks a little bit more peachy colored from the micro etch, but other than that, no color change. We then rinse it again, and this is when something very interesting happens. We put it into a bath of silver ions. Most silver salts are insoluble in water. Silver nitrate is one of the few that's water soluble. So this is a solution of silver nitrate. And uh, I think in dilute, uh, it's in dilute nitric acid. And the silver ions, Ag plus, will associate with the tin and they will actually remove electrons from the tin and the Ag plus, the silver ions will become silver metal. So this is a, a key component of redox chemistry. So we have copper ions that go into solution and then they deposit on the board and they become copper metal. Copper ions in solution are blue. Copper metal is a you know, sort of pink peachy color. Silver is uh, when it's a nice polished surface is a lustrous, nice silver color. When it's in the form of uh, nanoparticles, they're a very dull gray. So the board in this step within seconds starts to turn gray, especially in the holes where the tin is. Silver has a higher redox potential than tin. And you've probably seen this with these simple experiments where you take a nickel and you put it into, or what is it? or maybe no, at an iron nail, and you can set an iron nail into a solution of copper sulfate. Copper has a higher redox potential, uh, and so copper will just deposit on the surface of the nail. It's a common experiment, I think, that's maybe done in high schools. Uh, so that, that kind of reaction occurs simply because there is a difference in redox potential. And I won't bore you with a detailed physics lesson about why that is, but suffice it to say that silver will rip electrons off of tin. So it'll actually be two silver, two Ag zero, uh, sorry, two Ag plus will pull off an electron each from tin two plus to yield tin four plus. The tin is still there, but now you have all this gray and it's actually quite satisfying. I don't have, I don't think I have a picture of this actually, but the board- I would board, like to ask, I would like to ask yeah. then uh, the tin, uh, will not stick to the copper surface. It will only stick to the, uh, to the, you know, resin. No, the, the tin, the tin doesn't, the tin does not in any appreciable quantity at all uh, adhere to the, the copper. Okay, so, so it, will, so it will be basically only inside of the vias. Only inside of the vias. And the uh, silver though, silver has, uh, Silver has, I think, a higher redox potential than copper. So the silver will still uh, adhere to the copper, but it okay, will- Okay, so that's why also all the other surface will be then gray. It'll, it'll turn gray. Yeah, the whole okay. board turns gray quite quickly. Uh, but the holes in particular go from being fiberglass, sort of yellow brown color to gray. And oh, that's okay. because there's silver depositing. Okay. Uh, now, I, I didn't have much of a budget for this, so, and scanning electron microscope time is very expensive. Uh, so uh, it would have been, I think, I don't know, 50 or $100 an hour at the time. So I don't have any nice close-up images of this, but if you did take a scanning electron microscope image of what's happening in the holes, you would probably see clusters of silver all over the surface of the fiberglass. But it's not a continuous surface, and it doesn't need to be. These are catalytic sites onto which we're going to grow copper in the next step. So at this point in industrial PCB fabrication, 
um, there's, uh, there's other catalyst systems where they kind of put the tin and the silver in one bath. And actually today often they use palladium instead of tin silver. And so it's just a single step and there's still tin involved. There's often a step after to remove the tin and this bath is called the accelerator. Uh, I actually found that generally, uh, and it's usually an acidic solution, this would actually make it plate more slowly. Uh, I found that it generally removed, uh, too much of the silver actually got removed and then the, the electroless plating wouldn't work very well. So you can see I have a bath labeled accelerator, but I didn't actually use it uh, when I got the plating line working reliably. But on the industrial scale, usually there is a step called the accelerator bath that removes the pre-catalyst, the tin. Mm -hmm. But regardless, at this point in the process, we now have holes that have some sort of noble metal. So either uh, palladium uh, or in the, in the case of my process, we had silver. And uh, it doesn't matter as long as it's, uh, there's a certain set of metals, generally the platinum group metals, it would work with gold most likely. Uh, just gold is extremely expensive and it would be wasteful to try to do this with gold. Um, so now in the final step, of course we're rinsing very well between all of these steps. In the final step, this is where the magic happens. This is where the electroless copper bath will deposit copper on every surface that has either silver or copper. The electroless uh, chemistry is kind of like a metastable system. So if you think of it in electrical engineering terms, it's this uh, metastable, uh, I could say yeah, it's a metastable system that on, uh, on the one end, no plating occurs. And on the other end, plating occurs everywhere. What we want is plating to only occur where the PCB is in the solution. Otherwise, if plating just happened everywhere in the bath, you would get copper on the bottom, on the sides, on, on everything that is touching the bath. And we don't want that, that would be very wasteful. Uh, but we also don't want it to take forever. So it does have to proceed uh, relatively quickly. So we have to set the pH just right. It's a, usually a basic solution. It has to be slightly heated around 50 Celsius. And the concentrations of all the chemicals is just such that wherever the PCB is, wherever there's silver, nanoparticles deposited inside the vias or the outer surface of the copper, copper will deposit. We don't care about adding more copper on the large foil surfaces. There the copper is already thick. We just don't try to prevent it. It's a very small amount of copper being deposited. But while that's happening, the copper is depositing on those clusters of silver and the copper then covers all the silver and continues to grow on itself. And so instead of all these clusters of silver, you now end up with a growing continuous surface of copper, which will meet, will go from one end all the way to the other, as long as you have very good circulation of the solution. This gets to a very important point. If the aspect ratios of your vias is very high, at some point, the surface tension of the liquid starts to become a problem to reliably get the plating solution to go all the way inside the hole. This is the case for all of the steps. But especially with the electroless copper, you need constant mass transport of new copper ions to the plating sites. Otherwise, the copper plating rate will drop. And so you need to constantly be running fresh plating solution inside these holes in order for the plating to continue. And we don't need it to be very thick, remember, and advanced circuits actually specifies here between 45 and 60 millionths of an inch approximately. So you will see it, the board actually turns a sort of, uh, actually I do have a picture of it. There we go. Here is a board after electroless plating. Here's another one. The rack that held the board in place actually sat right on this edge. And so you can see there's no copper plating here, but there's copper plating here. And this is the very edge of my, my little tiny test coupon board. So there's now copper electrically connecting both sides. And if you touch a multimeter to both sides, you will see resistance on the order of an ohm or less. After the silver step, you will not be able to measure any appreciable conductivity from one side to the other. Maybe with a very sensitive key flea, it might be tens of mega ohms, but 
uh, no, no appreciable electrical connection until the electroless copper step has had on the order of 20 to 30 minutes to build up that 45 to 60 millionths of an inch of copper. Now, before we continue, uh, we would like to know more about electroplating process. And uh, that's what Kaylee is going to explain next. So here is more information about electroplating. And electroplating is something people are more familiar with. This is where you generally have a, a bath of, say, copper sulfate. It usually looks blue. They'll put some anodes of copper, these big copper bars and bags into the bath. And then the PCB is the cathode and you run an electric current through the bath. Usually it's acidic with sulfuric acid and copper ions will migrate uh, through the bath uh, and deposit onto the PCB surface and will grow a layer of copper wherever there is uh, copper material, copper exposed on the board that is electrically connected to uh, to the cathode. So, uh, to the, so the ground anode of the system. needs to be copper, and then this copper, copper from anode source of is, copper. Okay, and then this is transferred through the mm, through the solution. Yes, uh, and deposits on the surface of the of the PCB. You know all and the words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's, there's a lot of physics that goes into that, and I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of that. But uh, yes, essentially, in the, the presence of this, uh, it is a, it, it's relatively basic electrochemistry, uh, for those watching who maybe have some interest in electrochemistry, that copper Cu0, so it's uh, not, not in its ionic form, will uh, lose an electron at the anode and become Cu2 plus which is an ion, which is soluble in water. So on the very surface, you have a constant loss, or you could say a corrosion of copper off of the anode into the bath as a copper ion. And then because you have a pretty strong electric field from the cathode of the board to the anode of the, uh, copper, the copper material, uh, the source of the copper, the ions now in solution will migrate they don't migrate at the speed of light. They actually, they take a finite length of time and they are subject to the conditions of the uh, motion of the liquid. So if you actually, I tried this myself, when I electroplated in a beaker, if I had a stir bar spinning in one direction, I would actually get slightly more copper buildup on one edge of the board than the other. So the ions are quite literally, as they're moving, uh, as they're migrating from the anode to the PCB, uh, they will, uh, their motion will be distorted by the motion of the fluid. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to see that experimentally. So then the, the copper ion approaches the board and then at the cathode, it gains those two electrons back and becomes Cu0. It's now back to its metallic form. And uh, that, that will then build up a layer of copper. Okay. Now, when we learn about electroplating, we can continue with our process. So we can go back to our PCB. Uh, we just finished electrolyze plating and our PCB is ready for electroplating. And that's what Kaylee is going to talk about next. Okay, so we have our electroless copper. We've established electrical conductivity and you don't need a very high current carrying capacity on this in order for electroplating to occur. Because the current density will be uh, lower at the beginning because the copper is so thin, you could expect the plating rate to be a little bit, to be lower at the very beginning when the PCB first enters the bath. But as copper plates onto that via barrel, it will quickly increase uh, in conductivity, its resistivity will decrease, and effectively the strength of the electric field uh, will increase within the hole. So more copper ions will come in and will deposit. And so the via barrel will then build up its thick layer of copper. I wanna point out here that uh, there's a few more steps before we can actually electroplate copper. But remember, we started with copper foil and now we've plated electroless copper, but the electroless copper layer is very, very thin. When we go to electroplate copper that's thick, 
we're actually going to be plating uh, electroplate and copper on the outer surfaces as well. And that's how you ensure that copper runs all the way through the via and electrically connects reliably to both of the outer foil sides. But that means that we're going to be adding copper where there already is some copper. So typically the foil for a one ounce copper board will start as half ounce and they will plate the equivalent of half an ounce of copper entirely through electroplating on the outer surfaces and in the via barrel. So for all intents and purposes, you have half ounce copper inside the vias and you have one ounce copper on the outers. Yeah, I think uh, plating is normally like uh, 20 uh, microns or something like that to tell it in the other units. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> one, ounce, one ounce is uh, I think 1.37 mils. micrometers. And 30, yeah. Yes, 35 microns. So if it's half ounce, it's half of that. And then you plate up the rest. If you want a two ounce board, they might start with one ounce and then plate up to two ounces. And because proportionally, if you if you want a thicker uh, copper foil, you probably want the copper in the vias to be thicker as well. So they'll have to plate for longer to get more copper in the via barrels. It's one of the reasons why PCBs do get significantly more expensive as the copper weights go up. They're not just starting with a thicker copper foil and etching down. They're, they probably start with a thicker copper foil, but they also have to plate a lot more copper, which takes a lot more time. Electroplating copper is one of the slowest steps in PCB fabrication. Oh, uh, that can that's be on the order why of, they don't like thick copper, because then it takes longer for them to manufacture PCB. Because sometimes we, of, sometimes we ask them, like, can we use one OZ for these power planes or something. And they, by default, they always put their as thin as possible. <laughs> Half ounce. Yeah. Like JLC PCB, their default four layer stack up, if I remember correctly, is half ounce inners on a four layer and one ounce outers. So they'd be starting with a half ounce core that they etch, then they would add two half ounce uh, outers, drill, and then they plate up they would plate up an extra half an ounce. Mm -hmm. So you'll get the equivalent of half ounce layer in two and three, one ounce layers one and four, and half ounce vias. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, so we're talking on the order of at least one or two hours uh, for electroplating. And it, it depends on, on how thick you want it, and it depends on what the base foil is. But you can reasonably assume, as far as the, the PCB processes go, This is by far one of the slowest ones. Even etching is very fast. Uh, drilling also takes a lot of time. So of course, more drills, you wear their tools down, it takes a lot more time to drill, but electroplating is quite slow. Okay, so uh, before we electroplate, think about it, if we el electroplate everywhere and then we etch, that's extremely wasteful. If you only want some traces on the outer layers and we plate everywhere and then just to etch it down after, that's very wasteful of uh, copper and not very environmentally friendly. It produces a lot of extra waste when you etch. So instead, they selectively copper plate. The other thing to consider is how are we going to protect the copper inside the via barrels during etching? So we have to plate copper inside the vias to get our you know, thick layer of copper. But then when we go to pattern the outer layers, we need to protect the insides of the via barrels from the plating solution. And we want to do so really reliably. Even if the via or through holes are very large holes, we need to prevent those from etching. So we start off with, uh, this is the way advanced circuits does it. Some of them use a, a liquid film. Um, in this case, they use a dry film that comes in reels and then it gets very carefully Uh, placed on the PCB surface in a clean room to make sure that no dust gets in between the layers. And then the process is quite similar to the inner core. They will pattern it and develop. And in this case, it's a negative instead of a positive. So here, everywhere you want your traces to be is exposed and everywhere you don't want your traces to be has been covered by the mask. So in this case, there's our our nice exposed hole, and then we copper plate, we electroplate. 
And you'll notice that so we're actually copper plating with resist in place. The resist prevents copper plating from occurring where we don't want traces to be. And so this could be, you know, let's say you have, uh, you know, very large open areas of the PCB, none of that will plate up. It still has the original copper foil, but we're gonna get rid of that at the end. So we electroplate thick copper. This remember is still the electroless surface with relatively high surface resistiv resistivity. Electroplate copper. Now, this is a really important step. We then plate tin, usually electroplate. So after electroplating copper and rinse, the board immediately moves to an electroplating tin line, which works exactly the same way. The PCB is the cathode. You have bars of tin, which are the anodes, probably in a solution of tin chloride of some sort. And then we electroplate tin onto the copper. And this tin will plate into the via barrels. The key then, after we strip the resist off and then etch, is that the etchant will not attack tin, at least not very quickly. It's very hard to selectively etch copper in the presence of tin and ensure that absolutely no tin whatsoever uh, gets attacked by the etchant. And this is part of process control that you set the parameters of the chemistry just so, so that the, the tin is thick enough that the tin never gets etched all the way through, but the copper etches. And how, and in this, how thick is the tin? Did, do they say? Uh, I don't actually know. The tin doesn't need to be thick because we're gonna strip the tin off after. Yeah. The tin is just a resist. Yeah, I just was not sure how how thick it has to be to cover uh, the area safely. It, it'll it'll depend on the etchant they use for copper, and there are a lot of different etchants in use. Uh, I'm aware of there's I think some PCB shops that actually use dry plasma now to remove copper, but for hobbyists would probably be familiar with ferric chloride and uh, maybe, uh, maybe sodium persulfate. Ferric chloride is very messy. Sodium persulfate uh, is very similar. Uh, it oxidizes the copper and turns blue, right? Copper ion, Cu2 plus, goes into solution as the copper etches. And it will simply attack the tin very, very slowly relative to the copper. So all very, very little tin goes into solution and the tin protects all copper surfaces, the vias and the traces while all the remaining foil that we want removed is etched. I'm going to interrupt again. Uh, I actually found this very interesting. Uh, I knew they used the tin during PC manufacturing, but now I fully understand why they do it. Uh, next, uh, Kaylee has some pictures from plating, so she's going to show them in this video. Here is the next clip. There's some pictures that I, I forgot to show earlier. Yeah, that is bad plating. That's also bad plating. How do you know? What that do is see? slightly better. All these nodules, the surface is like sandpaper. And this so, is after uh, I took this picture, plating? Yeah, I took this picture. I took this picture on a microscope through the optics of a microscope. This is after electroplating. Oh. So before, before I had the chemistry tuned just right, and I'll show you here, I generated a, quite a lot of waste before I got it to work reliably. The, if the plating density is not high enough, and this is something you have to calculate, you look at the surface area of the PCB times two because you have both sides of it, and then if you do have a lot of internal features, say a lot of vias, you probably would have to take that into account because it, it dramatically increases the surface area that has to plate. And you need to get a certain current density per unit area that you want to plate. So you have to estimate the surface area and then you have to set the current to be not too high because then it will plate too fast and not too low because not only will it plate slowly, but will, it will also plate poorly in a different way. Uh, you'll get, uh, you can get these weird uh, clusters growing on the surface instead of getting nice smooth copper. And uh, at first I actually 
uh, the, the current density was too low. So I actually had, oops, I had PCBs that came out looking like this. And it's really, I mean, it feels like sandpaper. So that's, that's very poor quality electroplating. This one is a little bit better. This one's even better. Uh, I'm not sure, let's see if I have a, uh, yeah. So here's one that, this is actually a really, really nice electroplating. And here I've got a, I'll zoom in on the inside of a hole. And uh, you can see, look at that, copper makes the 90 degree turn into the hole very nicely. That's good quality copper plating. And I think you, uh, when we uh, talked together uh, before, you mentioned there is a technique how to um, how to prevent uh, the copper grow in some places faster than the others, or it just yes, or how so, how this happens. Here, actually, I just wanted to show this. This is the the side view of the of the PCB with all of the the weird growths. Wow. This is, this is when electroplating goes wrong. This is very, very poor quality electroplating. So yes, you can see that if you, if you get the parameters really wrong, you can get growths that are so large that even at low magnification in a microscope, you can see them and you can even feel them with your finger. But yes, there are chemicals that are added to the electroless bath. And uh, I, I didn't go into that. There was an organic additive that I added to the electrolysis copper and to the electroplating copper. There are these organic molecules that are attracted to these locations of higher current density. And so when they, when they come to those areas, they block those sites for copper ions to come and deposit. And these chemicals are called levelers or brighteners, uh, almost always these small organic molecules. And essentially they suppress the plating rate in areas that are growing already faster. So if an area is starting to grow a little bit of a mountain, it'll kind of tamp that down so the areas around it can grow a little bit faster. And so that helps to ensure that the copper, uh, that there's no defects in the copper. And so that in a cross section, it's absolutely filled and you don't have little voids or vacancies where there's copper missing. Uh, and also so that the surface is nice and smooth that you don't get this uh, roughness, which would actually be very poor for signal integrity. If the plating quality is poor and you have voids in the crystal structure, that will impact signal integrity if the plating quality uh, is very poor. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that the current carrying capacity, which is proportional to the cross-sectional uh, area of the trace, will, if there is a lot of copper missing, it will not be what you would calculate it to be. Yeah, correct. There's, so, there's a lot of, lot of work that a lot of material scientists put in for, my plating was decent, but I can promise you that industrial PCB fabricators have things very, very finely tuned to give excellent uh, copper crystal structure on every single panel. And actually, I, I realized I forgot to say something. You can cut this into the video after. Yeah, okay. So in the, the electroless copper bath, because there's no externally applied electric current, we have to provide the electrons somehow that will reduce the Cu2 plus ions to Cu0, to reduce the copper ions in solution, which look blue in solution, to metallic copper deposited on the surface of the PCB. Traditionally, the reducing agent is formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is quite toxic. It's a great preservative solution for biological samples, but it's really harmful to basically all life, certainly us humans. And so most, uh, most PCB shops, uh, I, don't, I can't speak for Chinese PCB shops, but at least in the United States, have moved away from formaldehyde and instead use reducing agents, for example, like glyoxylic acid. And in my electroless copper recipe, I used glyoxylic acid. It's a small organic molecule. Uh, you can kind of see where the formaldehyde part of the molecule is. Uh, the organic chemist watching will probably find that not a very technical way of explaining it. But the, the basic idea is uh, it, 
it provides the same, uh, the, it, it does, it's still a reducing agent in solution uh, and it provides the electrons in order to reduce the copper, but it simply isn't very toxic. And so this, this is kind of like an internal battery to the chemistry and that, that is intrinsic to the chemistry itself. And like I said, it's a metastable system. So this transfer of electrons from glyoxylic acid to CO2 plus ions will occur in the presence of a catalyst. And that catalyst can be either silver or palladium or copper. And that's, that's very key that it will plate onto itself and the layer of copper will become thicker and thicker and thicker as long as you keep it, uh, keep the board in the plating bath. It's simply impractical to use electroless plating to build up the full thickness of copper because you would probably have to wait weeks, maybe even months in order for the plating layer to become reasonably thick. Now it will be a very high quality plating layer because the plating rate is so slow you can be sure there's absolutely no gaps in the crystal structure. So basically everywhere there can be uh, an atom of copper, there is one. When, the, when you plate faster and faster, when you electroplate copper, for example, you have to be much more careful because any spot that starts growing a little faster, maybe the metal is a little thicker there, the current density is a little higher, the electric field is a little stronger, that spot will start to grow a little faster and you'll end up with a little spiky point. And this will happen all over the board at the micro level and you'll get a roughness of the board. You won't get that nice smooth finish. And there's a lot of factors that influence that like the concentration of the copper ions in solution, the pH, the electric field density, so the, basically the current that you put through it. And this is why there's usually two sets of anodes so you're plating on both sides of the boards. You never just plate on one side. Otherwise, you'll get copper on one side of the board and very little plated on the other. So you plate so, from both sides. So you sides. place the PCB somewhere in the middle in the and middle. then you have, okay. Two sets of anodes that are both hooked up electrically common to the anode. And the anode and the is PCB usually is the uh, like plain or is it just like tube or what is it? Plain yeah, I can, find, I can find uh, this one I do know that they have it here. So this is what the electroplating looks like. So here we have, start pulling it out. So here's, here's the PCBs mm -hmm. on the rack. So this bus bar is connected electrically to the cathode of the, uh, the power supply. And then you see these other bus bars here. These are the anodes and you can see hooked around them are these bags and inside the bags are the anodes. And you can see the blue, uh, it's, it's so concentrated that it actually looks quite dark, almost like an ocean, but it is actually this nice brilliant blue. You can see when the copper sulfate crystals crystallize out of the solution. And they put this in bags because if you don't, you actually get a lot of contamination. The copper as it's corroding off of the bars uh, will also produce little, uh, a little flakes of copper will come off. And because it doesn't just cleanly release copper ions into solution, there will often be little tiny micro flecks of copper that come so off. So they are like filters, the bags are like filters. Bag, yes. And you'll, you'll end up, uh, I did this myself when I did the, the electroplating. And uh, every time I plated, I would end up with a whole pile of very dark brown sediment at the bottom of the bag. And whenever I didn't do that, I would end up with more roughness on my PCB. So it is, it is actually very important that the anodes stay suspended in these bags and that the bags are changed once in a while to remove all that sediment that develops. And you can't just use any type of copper. Usually it's a high phosphorus, ultra high purity copper. So really the only intentional contaminant is phosphorus. Uh, it helps the copper to properly release, I guess you could say, to corrode off into the bath. Um, there's some very detailed material science for, or complex material science for why, so I won't get into that, but it's usually a high phosphorus anode bars, but with no other, uh, no other metals. You only want pure, pure copper. And so there are special 
copper alloys that are used specifically for uh, electroplating and for other metals as well. If you electroplate tin, you would have very high purity tin. If you electroplate nickel, you would have very high purity nickel. So that's the, that's the electroplating. And then I said we do the electroplating tin and uh, we etch and then we strip the tin. This is usually done with nitric acid and nitric acid will uh, attack the copper as well. So when this strip is done, again, the process control uh, is, is set such that the tin will be stripped off, but you don't let it sit in the etchant for longer. Otherwise you will start to etch the copper. This is really the case with all of these processes. It's the, a lot of chemists spent a lot of time with little test samples to get the temperature and the times just right. And as long as you maintain the, the chemistry at exactly the same temperature and exactly the same concentration at the same times, you should get the same result each time. So there are chemists in these factories that ensure that all of the parameters of the chemistry maintain or stayed, uh, stay at the same concentration, same temperature, the, the parameters uh, of the baths are invariant. So that I have you get a question. Process control. So what if they would not remove this thing? Uh, is it the other kind of surface which you can buy PCBs with and they yeah, are like so much think, cheaper? I think the uh, advanced circuits has what they call the bare bones PCBs. And um, just, just Googled it here quickly. So if you look for, uh, for PCB or event circuits, bare bones PCB, they look like this. So Not you can buy them Actually, and it's, it's even cheaper than like normal PCB, eh? Yeah, so here they don't even strip the tin and tin is a very solderable surface and tin will oxidize, but much more slowly than copper. And of course, solder is composed mostly of tin so they, they leave, they just leave the tin there and the surface is, is quite solderable. There's no solder mask and they don't strip the tin and there's no silk screen. So yes, these boards are a lot cheaper. They're also faster to manufacture. Mm -hmm. But uh, for proper uh, manufacturing, they will strip it because they would like to put there the mask and mask is usually placed on copper. Yes, exactly. So. At, at that step, you could pull the boards off the line and you have super cheap bare bones PCBs, or they continue, they strip the tin off and then they prepare for solder mask application. And sometimes people say uh, there may be like uh, some chemicals trapped inside of vias, then it would be during which process? when the tin so, is stripped off, I guess. So yes, when the, when the tin is stripped off, there could be actually with this particular process where they strip the tin at the end. And if they strip with nitric acid, nitric acid is, uh, it's not even a, it's not any material really that can deposit. Uh, the nitric acid will solubilize just about anything that will come off of this board. It's a very aggressive etchant. Uh, and once you rinse it with water, any residual nitrate ions that are hiding out in little corners are so highly soluble in water that really nothing should be left over. For other, other types of processes that maybe don't do the tin process, there could be some where you have some remaining copper etchant like uh, sodium persulfate. Really, this is probably be for, I don't know what JLC's process is, and I don't know if they would even tell you if you asked, but they're a cheaper board house. It's possible that they would do that. It's faster, certainly, than the tin process, uh, the, the tin strip process. But yes, historically, there could be issues with a little bit of residual, say, sodium persulfate etchant that gets trapped in an acute angle uh, or a very high aspect ratio via. And if it's allowed to remain and any moisture gets in to resolubilize the crystals of sodium persulfate, then yes, you could get these little patches, these little spots of 
of sodium persulfate or another etchant eating through some copper under your solder mask. So can, can this something, can something like this like damage contact inside of the via or com completely damage the via connection it, or? It would, it would depend on the thickness and width of the traces and the, the thickness of the copper in the via barrels. If it's an extremely tiny amount of contamination, it might matter if you have four mil traces and very high aspect ratio vias that are all uh, with quarter or half ounce copper, then of course there's just less copper. So uh, it doesn't take as much to eat through it. Mm -hmm. uh, with an acute angle, if you have a, a trace coming in to say an SMD pad and it's a three or four mil trace and there's a little bit of etchant at that acute angle attachment, yeah, there's, it doesn't have to go very far in order to cut through the trace. Mm -hmm. So this is why you do, why historically we have worried about acid traps when the traces are uh, very, very thin. A, a 20 mil trace is, is very unlikely to suffer from this problem. But again, it depends on the application. If it's a quick yeah. prototype that you'll use for a, a month before you move on to your next board, you probably don't care. If you're sending a rover to Mars, then you might uh, spend a lot more time uh, talking with your PCB manufacturer to be absolutely certain there can be no residual contamination mm -hmm. so that these because boards will still operate for 10 years. I, I haven't really seen any kind of problems with this. Maybe it used to be a problem, but, but I'm asking because I know some people, they keep asking these questions like, uh, what if there is something trapped inside of the via and it can then damage the via? So I just asked because I wanted to know when it would happen. Uh, I personally haven't seen it happen. And any modern PCB fabricator uh, should have the processes in place to ensure excellent washing of the panels so that there's no residual chemicals left in the via barrels after, well, really between any step. And it, it's not like they would care a lot about uh, cleaning the PCB between process steps so that they don't contaminate their own baths in their process and then not care about cleaning in, in the very last step. There's numerous wash steps along the way. So I think you would have to be trying to do a, a, a bad job of cleaning the PCB. Mm -hmm. uh, and the PCB fabricators know this. This was a lot of interesting information about plating process. I learned a lot. And um, at the beginning of this video, I uh, told you that we will also talk about a little bit different topics. So in the next clip, uh, we are going to talk about surface finish and gold fingers. Here it is. So then we have the final surfaces. Uh, so once we have the solder mask, we'll apply a surface finish. So hotter surface leveling is where you just dip the board into a vat of molten solder. Don't put your hand in there. And then as the board gets lifted out, there's air being blasted on the sides. You know one of those hair dryers from Dyson? You put your hand in up and down and they, they have these air blades that are kind of angled down. It's like that. As you're bringing your hand out, you can just imagine it's all this solder being flung back into the bath. Uh, under air pressure. But of course, the surface tension of the solder means that some solder gets left behind and it will congregate more towards larger pads, uh, maybe to one edge of a pad. If you have very, very small pads, they might cling on to a little bit more solder. And so you don't get a perfectly planar surface, which won't work for many QFNs or uh, pretty much any BGA. So instead, we might use ENIG. And ENIG is electroless nickel immersion gold. The electroless nickel process is really identical to the electroless copper. The difference is that instead of a source of copper ions, we have a source of nickel ions, say nickel sulfate. And uh, the reducing agent, uh, in order for that reaction to run reliably, again, metastable, uh, I don't know off the top of my head what reducing agent they use. It's probably not glyoxylic acid, but there'll be some other small organic molecule that will provide the electrons. Uh, to drive that reaction forward. And that reaction will only occur in the presence, again, of copper. 
And so electroless nickel will build up a layer on the, uh, wherever there's exposed copper. And in order to not be wasteful, especially of gold in the last step, you don't just do enig all over the board and then apply the solder mask. You apply solder mask and then you selectively do the enig everywhere where you actually want the pads to be so you don't waste uh, nickel gold. and especially gold. Now the gold is very thin and the gold goes last. So it's electroless nickel, immersion gold. Immersion gold is more like what I mentioned earlier, you stick the nail into a solution of copper, that reaction will occur simply due to the difference in redox potential of the metal ion versus the metal surface onto which it deposits. Gold has a much higher redox potential than nickel. So if you put uh, a nickel, as in a coin, into a solution of say gold thiosulfate, which is one of the few gold salts that are very soluble in water, then uh, the gold will just spontaneously deposit onto the nickel and you'll turn so you your nickel have gold. gold nickel. A gold nickel. Uh, it'll be a very, very thin layer because the reaction will only occur where there is nickel for gold to rip electrons off of and then in place deposit itself. So, so gold will not uh, it put will not continue on gold to of build. It, yeah, okay. So you might get, uh, I can't say for sure, it'll be uh, like flash gold on uh, header pins. When they say flash gold, it's a similar process. It's immersion gold. And immersion gold will only ever give you a very thin layer. And all that will do is prevent oxygen from, release, uh, from reaching the nickel surface. So the nickel will not oxidize. Now you might ask, okay, why can't we just put gold immersion directly on copper? Wouldn't that accomplish the same thing? And it would, because gold has a higher redox potential than copper. So it would actually work. And for a few hours, a few days, it might be almost the same. You could leave out the electroless nickel. But what starts to happen, this is unique to copper and gold and not to uh, gold and nickel, is that copper and gold have this tendency to migrate into each other. And so instead of having this nice surface of very, very thin layer of gold on your copper, uh, within not a long period of time, it will start to oxidize and you will no longer have just gold. You will now have copper oxide on the surface. And this, this there's a, again, very, very specific uh, detailed materials chemistry behind why this occurs with copper and gold, but not with nickel and gold. So nickel is what they call a barrier layer. And this is common in uh, plating of various surfaces, not just in circuit boards. There are other, you, you encounter metal plating all the time. There's all sorts of products that you have uh, maybe even tools, uh, nuts and bolts, uh, metal frames that are generally not just a single layer of cop uh, of, sorry, of metal, there might be some other metallic layers on top, cutlery, utensils. So electroless copper is actually relatively common uh, and immersion, uh, uh, immersion layers of, of metal deposition. So yes, in this case, we have electroless nickel in between. There's also organic solderable preservative, which is a, uh, a polymer matrix that gets deposited. Uh, I won't get into, go into that a lot, but it's cheap and it's certainly solderable. Uh, it won't give you quite the stability of uh, enig, but it will still be very planar. Mm. I never heard about it. I usually OS, only use OSD. enig. There's also another one called enipig which is electroless nickel, uh, electroless palladium immersion gold. And I think that's, I, it's used less, but it gives you a thicker layer uh, for wire bonding gold. And when you wire bond gold, you have to wire bond into a slightly softer metal. But the, given the, the, the chemistry and the expense of the various metals, they'll do uh, this, uh, uh, another layer after the nickel. So there, there's a lot of these different types of service finishes. Anytime you hear softer bondable gold, uh, that'll probably be, that could be electroless gold, and that'll be a lot more expensive because that's a lot more gold that gets deposited. Uh, there's also hard gold, like gold fingers mm -hmm. on the edge of a PCB. That it was is my generally, question. next question. That's electroplated gold. That's also expensive 
because it's, it's just a significant amount of gold. With immersion gold, we're talking maybe 50 to 100 atoms thick, but for that won't work for a connector that has to mate and unmate multiple times. You'll end up scratching the gold off, you'll expose the metal underneath, it'll oxidize, and you won't get a reliable contact, uh, especially if you want this to last many years. With hard gold, the gold layer is quite thick. And typically, uh, I'm not sure if I have a picture of it. Let me see if I can find one. It's pretty nifty, actually. The uh, hard gold plating lines. See if I can find a picture. Uh, there, there must be something on YouTube that I've seen at some point. But anyway, the, all of the fingers actually remain electrically connected. Uh, yeah, th I wanted to say this because if uh, people carefully have a look, they may see these thin tracks going up of the end of the fingers sometimes, and they were all connected together. And they, it will run through the plating bath in a line. And so they, they add the boards into this small panel that runs left to right. And when it comes out on the other side, you have thick gold fingers. And they've usually at that point, they've already done the solder mask. So the area that will receive the gold plating is already well masked off, but it still has that electrical connection between all of the fingers. And that'll get removed at the end when they cut the board out of the panel. But does it mean that also the other parts which are connected to these fingers will get the gold on them? So that's the key is the whole board doesn't get submerged. Ah, oh, I understand now. So only the, okay. Is that the, the gold fingers are, are along a single edge. If you wanted gold fingers on more than one edge in all likelihood, they have to run the board through more than once. Mm -hmm. But generally on, uh, uh, on a some sort of a, a a board that you'll plug into your motherboard for a computer, you have your gold finger, uh, the hard the hard gold fingers along one edge, and those all get plated on both sides at the same time. So and they basically put their like almost finished PCBs because normally you have more finished. more PCBs in one panel, so they need to cut them off the panel, and then it's it's probably. Uh, probably several in a row. I, again, okay. I'm trying to find a picture of this because I, I saw, um, I know I've seen this before, but I, I can't, I can't find one right it's now. Interesting. I never really thought how they do that. I tried to find a picture where all these uh, fingers would be connected together, but I couldn't find it. Uh, if uh, you have this kind of picture or if you have a link where we can see this kind of picture, please leave it in comments. I would like to see it and maybe also other people would like to have a look. Okay, next uh, we are going to talk about microvias, edge plating and castellated holes. So here is the next clip. You can put microvias in a four layer board. At the point where they drill the through holes all the way through, they can also laser drill on both sides, just layers one to two. And if you, uh, if you drill layers one to two, you then have to plate them and you can still do the electroless copper process. But in this case, you're plating down to hit the next layer, an actual flat surface instead of the edge of an annular ring. And then you still electroplate and still build up thick copper inside. But the way in which you actually fill the stacked microvia will depend on what's happening next. So you never want to have holes in the board, especially if the board is going to experience pressure or vacuum, because now you have pockets buried inside the board that will be subject to changes in pressure. So you never want to have voids. Uh, they can either fill it with epoxy. And if they do fill it with epoxy, They'll then planarize the entire surface with some sort of polishing process. And uh, then they can electroless copper on top of the epoxy and then electroplate again on top of the electroless. And that allows you to make what's called via in pad where you have a perfectly planar surface 
and you actually have vias that where the via barrel sits right underneath the pad. Normally you can't do this because the via is open, but here you get a perfectly flat surface. But because you have to fill the via, planarize it, electroless, and then electroplate, and, and then you can etch, uh, or some pattern process where it's a combination of electroless uh, pin and electroplating and then etch, there's a lot of steps involved. And it takes a lot more time to build, and so it's a lot more expensive. They can also, using uh, a similar uh, concept as these levelers and brightener chemicals, if the via is very, very, very shallow, in other words, the, thick, the layer thickness is extremely small, it can be possible for the plating solution to actually fill the via up. And with these levelers chemicals added to the back, it can suppress plating uh, around, say, the top annular ring and help it to fill the, the entire via barrel with copper. And uh, actually, this would be one example of it. So this would be a cross section where the via is actually filled with copper, but probably more likely you'll see vias that look like this or like this, where you can see the copper has connected and there is an interface here. And this interface uh, and these corners here are liable to crack. So there's very tight process control to make sure that you never get a fracture of a microvia. These are also very small much, much smaller than a normal via. It could be three, four mils in diameter, whereas your smallest drilled via might be finished hole size of 12 mils. In this case, it would be filled with an epoxy that matches the uh, thermal coefficient of expansion of the epoxy in the prepreg and in the core in order to ensure that as the board heats up and cools down, you don't get excessive uh, stress within, within the uh, microvia that would cause it to crack. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, they have to match the coefficient of thermal expansion. It's very, very important. So any epoxy you put in here, you can't just put any any epoxy. I thought they will leave it open. No, you so that that's what I mean. You can't leave it open because it's air. And so now you'll have a whole bunch of air bubbles inside your PCB. Oh, uh, but if it's on top or bottom layer, I mean. Yes, if you have open microvias, so yes, if you, let's say you have an eight layer stack and you have through holes and only microvias from one to two and say layer seven to eight or layer N to N minus one, then yes, you don't have to fill those microvias if they're not via N pad, you're exclusively connecting layer one to two and layer N to N minus one, mm -hmm. N to N minus one. Yeah, and I... in that case, yes, you don't have to fill them. It'll just end up filled with solder mask. Yeah, I know uh, once I, I talked to um, different PCB manufacturer and they exactly told me that even uh, buried vias, they always fill them with epoxy uh, because yes. exactly because air. of these reasons, yeah, there can't be any air. It can't be any air. And also consider that even though these, these volumes are very small, if you have many of them spread throughout the PCB, uh, even when you reflow the board, you're going to heat that board to uh, 260 Celsius or more. And so the air inside, which has a very different coefficient of thermal expansion from the surrounding fiberglass, uh, will, will expand and there will be some pressure exerted there. Now, uh, if there's any moisture left over, that could be really bad uh, because that water is going to boil and produce uh, vapor inside, and there'll be quite a bit of pressure inside. Now, if these are very small, and this is locked inside of basically a solid epoxy matrix, it might be okay, or it might cause a crack. And we can't afford to have a void or a crack. It would probably look like, yeah, something like that. If you get uh, some sort of little, little defect in your microvia, where there's no electrical contact anymore. Here is edge plating. So you can just see, this is probably finished with Enig. So you can see it's gold, it's actually really nice gold. That's so nice that it almost looks like it's even electroless gold. But there's, there's edge plating. Uh, here's a board, also looks like it's got a lot of edge plating. Castellated holes. 
And yes, I wanted to make a, a note about castellated holes. There's a cheap way of making castellated holes and there's the proper way of making castellated holes. Most cheap PCB manufacturers will treat these the way you would intuitively treat them, which is you drill them as holes, they get plated, and then in the final routing step, you just cut half the hole off. That makes intuitive sense, except for one problem. When you try to mill in the middle of a via, usually uh, there's, there's a very high chance that the milling head will tear into some of that metal and will actually damage some of those scooped castellated holes as it's cutting and or it may not cut all the way through the metal. And so there might be a little bit of extra metal that ends up folded inside. I've actually ordered PCBs from a Chinese, a cheap Chinese fabricator before, not JLC PCB. And they made my castellated holes that way. And I had to go over them and pick out some extra bits of metal mm -hmm. that ended up stuck inside the holes. So that's the cheap way to do it. The proper way to do it is the same way that you would do proper edge plating after electroless copper deposition, you take the board back to the drill room and you selectively mill, in the case of this board, you selectively mill the electroless copper surface away where you want there to be no deposited copper on the final board. And this ensures that when you electroplate, you only electroplate where you actually want there to be copper and you don't electroplate then a full circle. You only actually electroplate the where you want the final castellated hole to be. And so then when you go to mill at the end, well, you've already, you've only plated where you want there to be metal. So you don't have this problem and you'll get very, very consistent, beautifully made castellated holes. But it takes an extra step, a little more expensive. And it yeah. requires the PCV to go from the electroless line back to the drill room and then to the electroplating line. And a cheap PCB fabricator probably doesn't want that extra complexity and expense. So if you want good castellated holes, you'll have to pay for it. And uh, we are almost finished. There are two more questions what I really wanted to ask. The first one is how Kaylee learn all this? So in case maybe someone else would like to know where to get information, she's going to explain. And the second question, what I really had to ask was if you can plate your PCBs at home. And uh, here are Kaylee's answers. So the book, the Printed, Circuit, Printed Circuits Handbook by Clyde Coombs uh, is a phenomenal resource. And it really gives a great overview of all these different uh, processes used in printed circuit board manufacturing. But there's also patents. If you do any Google patent search, many of the patents are old and expired, but they give you a really good idea from another perspective of uh, what these, these different formulas can be. The printed circuit boards, the printed circuits handbook gives you really an overview, but the most of the concentration values I used in my own chemical plating recipes were from patents or from academic literature. And a lot of that is quite readily available. Uh, I realize that some academic papers end up paywalled, but uh, a lot of it is patents, which are freely available. Generally, they'll tell you something like, with an ideal concentration between 10 grams per liter and 70 grams per liter. And if you run it at 70, it might not work well, and I run it at 10, it might not work well, but maybe the ideal is somewhere in the middle, but more to one extreme or the other. So they don't say and exactly. They don't tell you exactly. Okay. And this will be for several chemicals. So the potential permutations and combinations is quite large. So I use more than one resource to help me narrow down where to start mm -hmm. so that I wouldn't waste a lot of time and a lot of chemicals getting it right. The electroless plating, actually, I got working much faster than the electroplating. The electroplating is more of an art in terms of the correct agitation, the current density, the shape of the container, the types of anodes, the anodes have to sit in the, in the bags. There, there are more things I had to consider. 
and uh, before I got the plating to be reliable. With electroless plating, you just really put it in the bath and move it back and forth to agitate, and it it just works as long as it's heated. And I, as long I would, as the pH I would is expect set right. it the other way around, actually. I, I thought so too. I thought the electroless electroless would give me a lot of trouble. It actually didn't. I got the electroless working pretty quickly. It's okay. it's. You can get electroplating to do something very easily, but to get it to plate well is an art. Huh. I didn't know that. Okay, so can you do plating at home? This will be maybe something what what my video will start with. Like, can you can do you it do at home? Can you do plating at home? Well, Jerry Ellsworth has made her own transistors at home. So, I would say if you can do that, uh, yeah, you can, I've already checked. All of these chemicals that I used, including glyoxylic acid, that's probably the hardest one to source, but all of the others, copper sulfate, tin fluoride, silver nitrate, sodium hydroxide, sodium persulfate, are all very readily available, plus deionized water, uh, nitric acid, dilute. So you can get all of these chemicals quite easily. A lot of people have PCB mills. You do need a milling machine of some sort that can drill all of the holes. Uh, I, I then milled PCBs after on the same machine. It was an LPKF Protomat S63 owned by Case Western. You could do, you could attempt to do a plating process, or sorry, an etching process. Uh, I would love to see someone actually try that, but you would have to protect the vias. And after all the work I did, I wasn't about to set up a tin electroplating line in addition uh, and figure out how to reliably apply resist to the board. So I just milled them. The, uh, I'd say in terms of equipment, just you need the containers. Uh, you can buy copper anodes uh, very easily and the anode bags that you put the copper anodes in. You can buy all of these things on Amazon. So there's nothing that prevents you from doing so. It's just more of a question of, especially circa 2021, where you can purchase PCBs so cheaply from JLC PCB and these other ultra low cost fabricators. If you're just a hobbyist and you want to make your own PCBs, unless you're, you have a really compelling reason to want to make lower quality PCBs very quickly, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's very an economical investment uh, I, I was an undergrad and it was a fun project for me at the time. So if you want a fun project and you want the satisfaction and you want to attempt to make your own multi-layer PCBs, by all means, I don't know, I, I explored this at one time. You can get pre-preg from Isola. You can buy foil. You can buy a t-shirt press as your laminator. I mean, you, you could go wild and you could do everything yourself. It, it probably wouldn't be cost effective. It would take a lot of your time. Uh, but I had a lot of fun doing it. So if you'd have a lot of fun doing it, then why not? And uh, that's everything for today's video. I need to say thank you so much, Kaylee, for finding your time. And uh, I really hope uh, people will like this video. I would like to ask everyone who was watching this video, don't forget to leave comments also for Kaylee, okay? Uh, leave comments uh, uh, about uh, topics which are related to this uh, video. Leave comments with your questions, what you would like to ask. Uh, leave comments uh, just as a feedback, what you think what Kaylee did. And also you can let me know what other videos you would like to see next. Um, okay, so basically, yeah, that's everything for today if uh, you like this video don't forget press the like button if you would like to see my next videos you know exactly what to do don't forget to subscribe i would like to thank you very much for watching and see you next time bye